Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Tinkstad. I'm the chair of the business and real estate group here at Beresford Booth. Uh, and I am uh, joined today by my colleague, Laura Davis. And, and we're very excited to present uh, for you today uh, what is really, a, uh, in our view, a, a very interesting topic. Uh, I, I do tons of, of transactional work, uh, lots of uh, LLC agreements, um, uh, purchase and sale agreements, things of that nature. And Laura, uh, the sandbox she plays in is much more in the employment world. And so she and I actually uh, collaborate a ton. Uh, so she keeps me on the straight and narrow on the employment side. And, and I try to keep her on the straight and narrow on the LLC side. And, and so we learned that there's a, as we talk about stuff as we do, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, sort of, um, it's not, I'm not sure it's a contradiction necessarily, Laura, but it's a uh, kind of an interesting quirk, I suppose, in Washington law, at least the way that I see it. And so, uh, and, and I'll, I'll let Laura uh, address uh, non-compete agreements uh, from uh, the employment side, because there's a, a statute came out a couple of years ago that really restricts the ability to use non-competes. But then there's an, uh, in, in the LLC side, there's another statute that says thou shalt not compete in, in certain circumstances. So uh, she and I will each be presenting uh, on this subject. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I think there are certainly a lot of planning opportunities that are available. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna uh, turn, uh, turn this over to you, Laura, let you talk about the uh, employment side. I, I warned Laura in advance, and I'll, for those of you who are watching, I'll warn you as well. I have a habit of, of uh, rudely interrupting with a question. I will, I will try not to be rude, Laura, because I also know that you can turn the tables on me when it's my turn, and, and, but the, the floor is yours. Uh, go, go right ahead. Well, thank you, David, and um, welcome everyone. This, we're talking about a subject that um, you know, I see come up quite a bit as far as non-compete agreements. Um, in, in, in the employee context. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about that this more, or this afternoon. Um, so these are the basic questions that you know, I, I hope to address as part of this webinar, as part of my, of my section of this webinar. Um, and so you know, this is, is gonna be providing you with a, a 30,000 mile view of this topic. So you know, certainly we, we're not gonna cover every in and out of uh, non-competes in Washington, but um, some, some basic questions that, that you know, we'll, we'll answer today. Can, do you use non-competes in employment agreements? Can you still use non-solicitation agreements? Um, and, and so um, as we are sort of moving forward and explaining what a non-compete is and what it isn't, which is perhaps um, uh, you know, applicable just as much, um, and when you can use it and when you can't, um, you know, I will start out by saying sort of uh, initially that yes, non-competes are often used in employment agreements. Um, and, uh, and generally, uh, as of January 1st, 2020, um, there are some new rules that the legislature put in place. Um, there was a new statute that got put in place um, and it really restricts what employers can include in non-competes uh, if they plan to enforce them after January 1 of 2020 or draft them after January 1, 2020. And we'll get to that in a second. Okay, and then the second one, the second question, uh, we will answer uh, uh, as we explain non-competes in the context of employment agreements. Okay, so let's start out with the statute. RCW 4962, effective January 1, 2020. But um, you know, a lot of employers started preparing for this statute in 2019 and started reviewing their non-compete agreements uh, going back then. So um, importantly, as I kind of mentioned, um, you know, this statute is effective January 1, 2020. If you have a non-compete that was signed prior to this, you won't be able to enforce it after January 1, 2020, and any agreements that are put in place after January 1, 2020 need to abide by the, the statutory requirements. So, you know, what are we talking about here? What is a non-compete agreement anyway? And what is the statute and, and why is it in, is it in existence? So, so there's a couple of important definitions 
uh, within the statute because the statute is really intended to affect the employee employer relationship. And, um, and essentially, there are some definitions that become very important uh, as we figure out what does competition even mean and what is an employee and employer. And actually, interestingly, the statute refers us for the definitions of employee and employer to the Industrial Safety and Health Act, which, as many of you might know, relates to safe workplace practices. So it's kind of an interesting link that they, they made there to the definition. But I'll start with the definition of employee, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. It says the term employee means an employee of an employer who is employed in the business of his or her employer, whether by way of manual labor or otherwise, and every person in this state who is engaged in the employment of or who is working under an independent contractor, the essence of which is his or her personal labor, labor for an employer under this chapter, whether by way of manual labor or otherwise. So, you know, not super descriptive with that. Um, you know, employer is, uh, it can include a person, a business, corporation, partnership, um, other business entities. Um, so, you know, when, when we're trying to figure out whether somebody is an employee or not, you know, that definition is not particularly helpful. It is a little vague. Um, so, you know, move, we move on now to what is a non-competition covenant, as the statute refers to it. So, um, also very broad, includes every written or oral covenant, agreement, or contract by which an employee or ind independent contractor is prohibited or restrained from engaging in a lawful profession, trade, or business of any kind. Now, I'll tell you that non-compete clauses generally come up in the context of post-employment restrictions. So usually where we see them in an employment contract is when the employer wants to restrict the time frame and the scope and geographic locations where an employee can and cannot work following termination of their employment. But, um, but you know, the statute is, is pretty broadly worded and doesn't suggest that that's the only time when a non-compete covenant could, in theory, be brought, but that's the majority of them that I see um, are primarily addressed uh, to uh, affect post-employment. So, so Laura, if I could uh, interrupt with a question, sure. to make sure I, I understand. So, uh, I, I assume uh, that um, it is it is rare, uh, uh, and I and I'm I'm saying this assumption as a statement. I guess I mean it as a question. It is rare that an employee who is currently working for an employer. Uh, that it is, it is rare that that person would compete while they're still employed. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the fact that a, a, uh, whether there's a duty or not as a matter of law, while someone is employed, the, the non-competition challenges don't come up until after employment has ended. And, and is, that, is that what you typically see in your practice? Yeah, that's generally correct when you have a non-compete covenant in place. Now, there are duties of loyalty in Washington state that may or may not apply um, as far as current employees um, with respect to their current employment. Um, but generally, what I see is non-compete statutes that address post-employment concerns, and that's a lot of times where there's sort of the, the risk of liability, primarily with respect to this statute. Mm -hmm. And so how, just a question then about, about how those are, are enforced. Um, I mean, I suppose one could get uh, money damages. Is there, are there any other, you know, sort of remedies that are available for an employer uh, that, uh, that are uh, typical if there is such a thing? So uh, the, the RCW uh, for non-competition covenants actually details damages. And, uh, you know, an, uh, an employer who violates the RCW is liable for actual damages or $5,000 as a penalty, whichever is more. But the, the big issue is that the statute provides a remedy for attorney's fees, costs, and expenses. 
And so that's where a lot of uh, the expense, of course, comes up. So $5,000, you know, a, an employer might read that and say, oh, $5,000, well, that's, that's, you know, what's my risk? Who cares? Um, or, you know, it's a, it's a low risk. I feel like I can probably manage that or mitigate that. Um, uh, or actual damages, maybe they aren't that much, and you kind of do a risk assessment and say, oh, okay. But it's the it's the attorney's fees, which as you and I both know, David, can add up very quickly into the tens of thousands of dollars, especially if you go to litigation over something like this. So so um, while the, the statutory damages may not um, sound that large, right. um, certainly the attorney's fees is, is one thing that, uh, you know, we look at as far as damages that can add up very quickly yeah no that's a great point uh and and i i presume though if if a if an employer complies with the statute and and has a valid non-compete agreement because they complied with the statute can can they then sue the employee to prevent the the non-competition as well um, sure. So, you know, that's a really good question. And, um, and certainly there is a, a cause of action that might be permissible there too. It's just going to be a, you know, analysis by the employer as to whether or not that's worth it to them to pursue something like that. But certainly, um, you know, violating a non-competition covenant, you know, especially in an employment agreement, there might be um, some, some ability to pursue um, to pursue damages from the employee, um, uh, you know, through breach of contract or other types of actions, um, as long as it's compliant with the statute. Um, so, you know, so we've kind of talked about, you know, non-competes and the definitions of them. And so it's important to also point out what is not included in this statute. So a non-competition co covenant is, they, they actually spell this out. Uh, in the statute. The legislature actually specifically said, which is fun because sometimes you don't see this in statute, um, but they are arguably just as important as defining what it is, define what it is not. So it does not include a non-solicitation agreement. Ah, okay. So our, our question from the first slide. Okay. Uh, it does not include a confidentiality agreement. These are agreements that are commonly seen in employment uh, contracts where they talk about what confidential information is and that you can't disclose confidential information to third parties and kind of putting some restrictions around that. Um, it is not a covenant prohibiting use or disclosure of trade secrets and inventions. There's actually separate statutes that talk about trade secrets and inventions. Um, and it is not a covenant entered into by a person purchasing or selling goodwill of a business or otherwise acquiring or disposing of an ownership interest. And so we're gonna you know, be talking a little bit about LLCs in a second um, with, when David talks about um, sort of the competition statutes with LLCs, but it's interesting to note that that is actually specifically spelled out in the statute that it, is not, it does not apply in that particular circumstance. And it does not apply uh, to a covenant entered in by a franchisee when the franchise sell complies with other statute. So, um, you know, don't see that one as often, um, but it is in there and it generally applies when you have an employee who um, goes from one franchise to another. And, and um, Laura, Laura said, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is really a great point that you've just made uh, because so often we, we get uh, tied up in, you know, all the things that, oh, you cannot do, you can't have a non-compete. And, and so, uh, it's really important to understand, but hey, but yes, there are things that are expressly allowed. And so employers should uh, be mindful of, of non-solicitation, non-disclosure type agreements, because that, that is required. You're required to have those to protect, for example, your trade secrets. You have to, 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 to uh, if, if a court is going to uh, uh, recognize the, the uh, importance of a trade secret, the employer has to have taken steps to try to protect that information. Uh, and so there's a, and there's a ton of value there for, for an employer to, to do those things. So instead of concentrating on what you can't do as an employer, really important, and Laura, it's a great point, still do what you can do. And, and the non-solicitation, non-disclosure, those sorts of things should absolutely be done. Uh, and, and Laura, do you think 
that does it does it matter um, the the time the timing in terms of uh, when you hire an employee for when you ought to be thinking about a non solicitation non disclosure agreement I mean can you do you show up on the first day and can you can you give them that or or should you do it before you hire or do you, do you have a sense for for what makes the most sense from an employer's perspective? Mm -hmm. So that's a really great question, David. And, um, you know, with a lot of, with any of these provisions, um, you know, these should, in, including the non-compete, and in fact, there's a part of the statute that talks about um, this, where you have to disclose any non-compete um, covenant uh, no later than the time the job offer is expected. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of, uh, employers actually have questions about this with respect to, well, what if I have current employees who maybe had, were subject to an old non-compete prior to January 1, 2020, what do I do? And, you know, a lot of times it's a really good question. So one, if it was signed, if the non-compete was signed prior to January 1, 2020, you have the option not to enforce it, or you can renegotiate, but you'll have to provide some additional what we call consideration, which just basically means something above and beyond what the employee would ordinarily be entitled to by virtue of their employment. Um, and so, you know, we saw a lot of this happening sort of end of 2019 as we came into 2020, a lot of these renegotiations. And so sometimes, um, you know, we still see these. Um, and so, so, but at, at the same time that you're um, providing these non-compete covenants, um, you know, it's, important to also have these other provisions in that same contract. So provisions about confidentiality, provisions, and, you know, and even though they're defined as not included, you know, they're not defined within the statute as far as what is included in the statute, and they're not subject to the statute, it's still important to, to outline them at the same time so that the employee knows going into it, it, it doesn't make sense to sort of piecemeal these agreements, especially if you have a new employee. Um, so, you know, what is the non-compete, we've talked about the non-compete covenants, but what does it actually say? So, um, there's a couple of really key points here. Um, first of all, it says, you know, you can't enforce a non-compete against employees who do not meet a salary threshold, which is very interesting. It's quite high and it changes every year. So it increases every year. Um, when this law was, was enacted it was uh, in, in 2020 it was $100,000 now it's up to 101,390 to adjust for inflation and for independent contractors that amount is actually this year 2021 $253,475 so that's quite quite a amount um, you also can't require enforcement of a non-compete that's not subject to Washington law so sometimes you'll see this with multinational employers who have employees who work in Washington. Um, it, it, if they're a Washington employee, they're subject to this RCW and the protections of this RCW. Um, you can't require non-competition -compete covenants that extend beyond 18 months after the end of employment. So a lot of these old non-competes had, um, you know, had time frames, two years, even you know five years in some cases, and so the legislature said no, 18 months. That's it's presumed to be um, uh, uh, the time frame to go with. Otherwise, you know you're you're kind of kind of an uphill battle to con to convince a court that more than 18 months would be appropriate or justified. Um, so uh, and then you know interestingly, if you lay off an employee, you could owe um, the employee their salary for the duration of the non-compete period following employment. So if you are planning to lay off employees, that would be a time when you would want to call, um, you know, to go over your options, um, uh, you know, call me or call David or another trusted attorney at Beresford Booth um, or attorney of your choice because um, you know, there might be some liability there in your particular situation. Um, and then as we kind of talked about before, you have to disclose, you know, at the time that the job, by the time the job offer is accepted. Um, and there's another really interesting part of this covenant or this RCW um, that talks about an employee having an additional job. Um, and, you know, this is often referred to as moonlighting. That's uh, sort of the common uh, uh, knowledge 
title for this type of thing where an employee is working for their prime for their employer and then gets a second job. And this statute actually spells out, I've uh, got my three bullet points there, um, that you, you can't prohibit an employee from doing that, um, you know, supplementing their income if you pay them less than two times the minimum wage. And so if we're talking about just you know different localities have different minimum wages. But in Washington, generally, it's $13.69 an hour, so you double that. For those who enjoy math, that works out to be $27.38 an hour. So if you're paying them less than that, you cannot prohibit them from having an additional job or supplementing their income. Now, that does not apply if there's issues of safety or, you know, the additional job interferes with the scheduling expectations that you might have. Um, and you know, interestingly, it, it also says on here that it does not alter the obligations of an employee under other existing laws, including the common law duty of loyalty, conflicts of interest, and cor quote, corresponding policies addressing such obligations. And unfortunately, there's not really much more in the statute to go on to define um, what, you know, how that affects, you know, because duty of loyalty generally means that you can't compete, uh, you know, there's, there's, certain other common law provisions, but you know, you owe your employer um, a, a duty to, you know, do what's in their best interest and not compete with them. And so, uh, so in, in those circumstances, it's not real clear in the statute what they, you know, how that conflicts or doesn't. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, a lot of employers will have uh, policies in place. And I think it's a good idea to define the steps to take if there's uh, another job that the employee wishes to get um, and, you know, to notify the employer that the employee is, is planning to get another job or has got, has gotten another job, I should say. Um, and then, you know, leave it to the employer to look at whether there's a safety issue with that, um, you know, whether that interferes with scheduling and whether there might be potential conflicts of interest with the employer's business. Okay. Uh, All right. Well done, Laura. Thank uh, you. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Awesome. Talk about LLCs. Yeah. Now, now we're getting to the good stuff. Uh, so, so just kidding, just kidding, Laura. Of course, employee stuff is fantastic, uh, and and so um, I just wanted to to uh, tell everyone uh, you're welcome to put any qu uh, questions uh, in the chat box, and we'll answer them uh, if possible. Um, and, and so moving on to LLCs, where in a limited liability company, uh, uh, there's a statute that expressly says that, um, that uh, members and managers cannot compete uh, with the LLC. And so contrast that with everything that Laura just talked about uh, on the employee and independent contractor side. Uh, where we have a statute that says uh, you can't have such an agreement. Now you have the legislature not, not only saying that you uh, can have such an agreement, but you can't compete it, it, when you're in this, this setting. Uh, and, and the setting is if you're a member in a member managed LLC, then um, you can't compete with the company while you are a member. Now, from a timing perspective, it is, I will tell you that it's not clear, the law is not clear. If you're no longer a member, uh, that it doesn't say whether that uh, uh, alleviates your duty not to compete. Uh, I, I think it is a fair read of the statute uh, to say that it does terminate that, but I don't, I, it's never the law according to Dave. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, it's kind of one of those un, unknowns at this point. And then similarly, if you are a manager in a manager managed LLC, then you have that same duty not to compete. So uh, the and and the uh, uh, so we have this slide up. And, and Laura, do we have the the uh, the slide that has the rest of the statute on it? I'm gonna make sure we maybe maybe it's not there. Okay. So uh, point simply being that this statute that's identified, uh, and I'm touching my screen as if you all could see that. Uh, 2515038 goes through a, a different duties uh, of members and managers. 
uh, uh, there, uh, the statute is called the uh, fiduciary duty statute. And so uh, with that statute, again, it's, it's important for, for you to understand, hey, am I mem is my LLC member managed or manager managed? Because the rules uh, differ uh, depending on, on uh, which kind of management structure that you have. It's, it's not, uh, the, the statute, unlike a lot of uh, non-compete agreements, does not have a geographical limitation or a time limitation. So oftentimes, and Laura, you can confirm this, that, that you have a, a, a non-compete agreement that says you, uh, a certain employee will not compete, for example, in uh, the state of Washington or uh, in all of uh, Washington, California, uh, and Oregon, or west of the Cascade Mountain Range, something like this. Um, where uh, 2515038 doesn't have that at all. It just says thou shalt not compete. Uh, and, and so most LLCs have an LLC agreement uh, that should uh, address that. Uh, and I think it is possible if you wanna clarify the, the timing restrictions, uh, I think it's entirely appropriate within the context of an LLC agreement to do that. Uh, so, so there, there are ways to have uh, uh, an enforceable non-compete agreement within the context of an LLC. Certainly, there are ways to have have that, you know, in the context of a business sale as well. The statute ex uh, expressly uh, deals with that situation uh, as well. So, the, there are uh, our presentation today is not intended, you know, to be sort of all-encompassing, but but rather to to highlight. The, you know that there are there are different kinds of business structures and different kinds of agreements that can and should be used at different points in time, uh, and it is and you know Laura uh, mentioned this uh, in her presentation that when you hire that employee, that's when there needs to be this discussion. Well, when you, uh, uh, and and you need not just the discussion, but you actually need to enter into the agreement. There's timing components that are absolutely essential, procedural components that are essential. Uh, and, and the same thing is true for LLCs, that uh, when at the time that you form your LLC, it is, uh, it is absolutely essential that you have a written LLC agreement that deals with a whole host of issues, including these kinds of fiduciary duties and, com and competition and, and confidentiality. And so even though those obligations don't arise out of an em uh, employer-employee situation, they are nevertheless real. And typically you're talking about uh, key employees uh, for such a relationship. Uh, and so I think it's really critical as, as you're evaluating your business structure uh, that, that you consider, at, uh, okay, well, which parts of, of non-compete rules are important to me? Uh, because on the corporate side, it's very, very different. So uh, uh, so your choice of entity matters. The timing in which you do these things matters. And, and so uh, we're, we're just about out of our time uh, here today. Uh, and, and so uh, what I wanted to encourage everyone to do is get out your LLC agreement. What does it say about these things? Because it can, your LLC agreement can vary the statute. Uh, and, and similarly, there's all kinds of, of additional obligations with respect to the uh, uh, to a fiduciary duty not to compete. There are other fiduciary duties within what we call the duty of loyalty uh, that are, uh, are, are must be strictly complied with. And, and we do uh, tons of, of business litigation here. Uh, and almost in every case, these fiduciary duties in a, in a business matter uh, are implicated, whether it is uh, a dis disputes among members or shareholders, um, the fiduciary duties are, are always in play. And so trying to understand uh, with, with clarity what those duties are really matters. And so, uh, Laura, I guess what I'd love to do is maybe throw it back to you uh, to kind of to, to sum up, but I just want to remind everyone, LLCs can have uh, uh, the and do have the duty not to compete when you're a member or manager in certain circumstances. So Unlike employment, where there are huge restrictions, there aren't nearly the restrictions on members and managers. 
Uh, and so, uh, Laura, I, I guess I'd like to throw that back to you uh, as we're as we're basically out of time here. Yeah. So it's important what you just said too, just to wrap up that there's a difference between employees and members or managers of an LLC, and those can have very different definitions. So just you know, if, if, keep that in mind that members or managers of an LLC are not generally defined as employees. Right. So um, important to keep that note. Um, and so we are out of time. Um, so I um, appreciate everybody uh, participating here and, uh, you know, certainly thank you for, um, for tuning in. Um, our contact information is here. If you have any follow-up questions, we're out of time. I believe there's a question in the queue. Um, be happy to um, follow up uh, if you want to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is there. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, if you ever have any questions, uh, we are a full service legal firm. So please feel free to reach out, not just on this issue, but if you have any legal questions at all. That's right. Th thanks, everyone.